Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the May 2023 edition of The Morning Blend. I'm Allison DeFlorio, your co-host for today, and joined by my colleague and friend, Lori Armstrong-Halber. Hi, Lori. Good morning. How are you? Good. You know, I'm so glad we have these morning blends, so at least I know I get to see you um, once every couple of months. I know we talk more frequently than that, but it's nice to see you. And yes. thank you again for your partnership in making this happen. For all of you who have joined us this morning, thank you for once again taking time to hear some HR and legal updates. Uh, if you are a returning uh, listener or watcher to the Morning Blend, you know that we put these on to try to help our HR and business community just stay on top of some of the current issues and some of the emerging issues that uh, may be facing your businesses. So we hope to share our experiences as, as, as Lori from the legal perspective, what she's seeing uh, in her space and, and from the HR space, what we're seeing um, from our clients, and then also share some insights on what we're reading about and as far as trends. Uh, just as a reminder, all of your uh, phones will be on mute, but your questions do matter. And, and even though we have content, we wanna to get to as many questions as we can. So if you do have a question, please type it in. We will do our best to get to as many of those as we can. And our contact information will be shared at the end of the session. So if we can't get to your questions, we're both more than willing to uh, hear from you after the session. Uh, we will be recording this, so we'll send a link out afterwards, and you can feel free to send that to someone that maybe you think would find it of value and who wasn't able to attend today. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to our behind the scenes coordinator of all of this, Whitney. Uh, thank you, Whitney, for always making the, our technology work and, and keeping us on, on task here. Um, if you have any technical issues throughout the uh, broadcast this morning, just feel free to type that in as well, and, and, and Whitney will be able to assist you. So with that said, um, I want to go ahead and just uh, do some quick intros. Many of you have been on before, so you've, you, you know that I'm co-founder managing partner of Exude Human, Cap, uh, Exude Human Capital, and we're a, a consulting firm specializing in the areas of human resources, leadership development, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belongingness. So we really focus at the intersection of the three of those. Um, I hope to share with you today uh, some experiences we have with our clients across the board as it relates to the topics that um, we want to share with you. And I'll turn it over to Lori, who's been our longtime partner, legal partner from Fox Rothschild. Lori? Thanks, Allison. So uh, for those of you who I haven't met yet, I have been practicing in the space of workplace law for over 25 years. And in my spare time, I corrupt young legal minds as an adjunct professor at Temple Law School. And uh, I'm also a volunteer mediator at the EEOC. So my practice is devoted to really all aspects of workplace law. I have um, tried uh, cases before juries on the discrimination, harassment, retaliation claims, um, I have handled matters involving wage and hour with the Department of Labor, and I also spend a bit of time in the traditional labor space um, dealing with uh, union campaigns and collective bargaining. But really, the, the funnest part of my job, I think, is um, the, the counseling and the training aspect and doing things like this with Allison. And Allison and I actually met as co-panelists, I don't remember how many years ago now, at least Five, um, doing a harassment prevention uh, training thing and became fast friends. And I really do appreciate Allison's friendship and Fox's partnership with Exude. Um, I should mention that, that Fox is a full service firm. So th that I am in the workplace law space um, doesn't mean that our firm is limited in the types of space we can help others with. We do everything from you know, corporate transactions and commercial litigation to family law and trust and estates planning and pretty much everything in between. So Allison, thanks again for hosting us today. And uh, I think we should get started. That's so funny that you brought up the, how we met. I was just thinking about that. I'm like, how long ago was that? But uh, again, thank you for, for your partnership. So let's get on to our, uh, our program for today. So Piping Hot, 
Uh, we're gonna hear from Lori about what's happening in uh, pregnant workers fairness with the Pregnant F Workers Fairness Act and weight discrimination. So I think this is really interesting. You know, this is something we haven't spoken about before on um, the Morning Blend. So curious to hear what's happening in that space. And then for the Daily Brew, we're going to talk about the end of COVID, whatever that means and what employers should be thinking about. Um, there are some legal aspects to that that Lori will cover and then we'll talk about what we're seeing in the workplace with employers trying to draw people back into the office. And we're gonna talk about artificial intelligence. So this is also something we haven't addressed on Morning Blend before and it's certainly capturing a lot of attention and moving at uh, warp speed. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Lori to take us through the piping hot topics. So it's I, there's a typo on the slide, I apologize. It is the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, um, which I, it, it comes into effect next month. And I'm surprised we're not seeing more out there about it. Um, but it's a, it's a um, legislation that's designed to address some gaps. So I just wanted to briefly mention that the Pregnancy Discrimination Act has been around since 1978, um, and it was an amendment to Title VII, and it required employers to treat employees who are affected by pregnancy or childbirth or related medical conditions in the same way that you would treat now other similarly situated employees. What does that mean? other folks with temporary um, impairments. And so the example we gave back in the day was, if you give an employee who has a heart attack six weeks off for work, you should be able to provide a similar accommodation to a pregnant person who needs you know, time off to recover or for the birth of a child. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed um, 12 years after that and then amended in 2008 and that requires employers to provide reasonable accommodation, as you know, to employees who have a qual uh, qualified individuals with disabilities. And those could include certain conditions that related to pregnancy, so gestational diabetes and what have you. So there might have been uh, a requirement under the ADA to provide leaves of absence or other accommodations like light duty, et cetera. Um, if someone who was pregnant had a uh, connected or related condition that would qualify as a disability. So the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act is, is designed to kind of deal with the gaps in between those, right? And um, what I mean by that is it's going to require accommodations related to people who are pregnant or have childbirth or some, some sort of related condition um, in a way that hadn't been required under the ADA or the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. In other words, we don't have to um, prove that the pregnant person has a disability to get this accommodation. It covers employers who are 15 or more. Um, the, it, it is somewhat similar to legislation they've had in California. And as is typical, we see often legislation and protections on the state front before we see it on the federal. Um, we've now seen this on the federal. So, um, you know, these are some specifics that make this a little bit different. Um, it requires covered employees to accept an accommodation, or I'm sorry, it prohibits requiring employees, and this is different from requiring covered employees to accept an accommodation other than any reasonable accommodation arrived at through the interactive process. So I don't know if you know this or have thought about it, but under the ADA, it's the employer gets to make the decision. This is the accommodation as long as we are um, providing a, an accommodation that's reasonable, that is all that's required. This seems to suggest that it needs to be a, a uh, and interactive and that the employee might have some say. Although we haven't seen this fleshed out yet, there's no regulations yet, there's been no um, litigation. So um, it prohibits denying employment opportunities to covered employees based on the need to make re reasonable accommodations, which I think is just an expansion of those prohibitions. We don't want to be treating um, pregnant people in a negatively discriminatory way, but we want to make them we want to make it a, a possible for them to continue to be included in the workforce as long as they are willing and able to work. Um, you can't require an employee to take leave if there is another reasonable accommodation that can be provided. So again, uh, under the ADA, we've, it's long been that the employer gets to choose. This legislation 
suggest that uh, there are some limits to that. And of course, um, I'm going to mention retaliation because all of the anti-discrimination statutes contain a provision that prohibit discrimination or retaliation against an employee who's either um, reported or opposed some sort of unlawful discrimination under the act. So why is this piping hot as opposed to just the morning brew? Well, it's happening next month. So you should uh, take a look at your policies in your handbooks, your procedures, see if they're up to date, consult with either your partners at Exude, or you can call me or your regular labor and employment council and make sure that um, you have the appropriate provisions in place uh, that go with along with the requirements of the PWFA. It is interesting that I, I haven't seen much of it in the HR uh, news either. So so it's interesting that this is is taking is going into effect next month. Um, so so let's go ahead and talk about our next topic, which is around weight discrimination. So interestingly, in the past couple of months, I've been interviewed a number of times by different publications and a podcast, I think, on weight discrimination. And I was telling Allison that just last week, um, a reporter from the Wall Street Journal had picked up something I was quoted in and said, I, you know, I want to talk to you about weight discrimination. Is this a thing? You know, are we seeing it? And it's getting a lot of play, which uh, suggests that you're going to see more about it and you're going to start to see more legislation than we've had in the past. Uh, some of the drivers are that statistically, um, according to at least one study, and, and I confess, I'm not sure what they use to define overweight or obese. I recognize that there are a lot of arguments about whether BMI is an appropriate indicator. I also recognize that um, there is probably legitimate discussion about our society in general and our approach to health and fitness and the focus on you know, weight versus health and fitness and what does the diet industry do and what does the fitness industry do. Our discussion today is not really about those things, but I want to acknowledge that those are legitimate areas of discussion. It's about whether or not states or um, the federal government are looking at providing protections for people who are overweight so that they won't be discriminated against in the workforce because of that. So um, anyway, according to this one study, 74% of adults fall between the weight range of overweight and obese. And there really is no protection on the federal level at this point, possibly obesity, morbid obesity, or if you have a disability that's sort of ancillary or related to obesity, again, it would have to be a medical condition that substantially limits a major life activity in order for there to be coverage by the ADA. So merely, air quotes if you can't see me, uh, being overweight or obese is probably not sufficient for coverage under the ADA, although there are a few courts out there that have, have sort of tipped the, dipped their toe into expanding the definition. Michigan is the only state that has a prohibition on weight discrimination. They've had it since 1976. They, their legislation actually prohibits discrimination on the basis of weight, height, and age. And one of the things that's sort of interesting is more than half of the U.S. states have laws protecting people who smoke cigarettes on their own time. Now, why do we kind of put those together? Well, typically, cigarette smoking, um, weight, or size are sort of viewed as health, quote, related issues and, quote, off-duty type situations, right? We're not, we're not in the business of people smoking or not smoking generally in our workplace. We're not in the business, unless we're in the fitness industry, probably, it, it, you know, about that sort of thing. We're talking about what people are doing in their, on their own, how they're treating their bodies on their own, and whether or not we as employers should have some say over that as it relates to the workforce. And so, you know, smoking has long been proven to be detrimental. And all the things you hear about, uh, the stereotypes about people being overweight, well, they're a health concern and they're gonna be sick more, they're not gonna come to work, are the same sorts of things that could be said about smokers. And yet we have, you know, half the states protect smoking um, and there's limited protection. And I would argue probably that more people fall into this potential category of protection on, the, on being overweight or obese. 
Um, in New Jersey, a couple of years ago, there was a case, the, it's called the Borgata Babes case, where um, some of the women sued over the Borgata weight restriction policy that they have for their cocktail waitresses. And the court in New Jersey said, yeah, well, it's not a protected class under the New Jersey law, so they can do that, sorry, essentially. Um, in the past couple of years, we've seen various cities expand protections for weight discrimination, Binghamton, New York, Madison, Wisconsin, Urbana, Illinois, uh, Washington, DC, San Francisco, Santa Cruz. But just last week, New York City's uh, council passed their own amendment to their human rights law to include height and weight as protected categories. It will go into effect 180 days after the mayor's expected signature. Um, it will prohibit discrimination on the basis of actual or perceived height or weight um, in all employment decisions. And it will provide exceptions, I should say, however, it will provide uh, exemptions where such preferences are either required by law or an individual's height or weight would prevent them from performing essential job functions of the job with or without an accommodation or where height or weight is reasonably necessary for the normal operation of the business. So there are some exceptions, but generally speaking, New York City is going to expand its protection as well uh, into this area. So interesting. Do we know what's driving that, particularly in New York City? You know, I don't. I know that there was similar legislation. That for New York, it's been pending for a while. It, it failed, I think. Maybe the next slide talks about a couple of the other failures, if we still have them. But um, uh, there have been other efforts, and they have failed in other parts of the country. Um, Got it. So this is not just, yeah, let's switch. Let me see if the next. Now we go right into um, our daily brew. Oh, we must have lost a slide. That's fine. So there were other jurisdictions, for example, Texas. Um, uh, there's been some court activity down there about uh, obesity. Massachusetts had a pending legislation that they, that didn't, didn't get through the legislature but so this is sort of bubbling up in a lot of different jurisdictions. I know that in New York, it did not get through the first time, um, but, but we are, it's there now. So um, I think you're gonna see it on, on, in other jurisdictions as well. And look, my bottom line is, if as an employer, you're not focusing on skills, experience, right. um, education or training, you're not focusing on the right thing anyway. Um, mm -hmm. When we're focusing on assumptions or stereotypes, we are missing an opportunities with, with our folks. And so I'm not really up in arms at all as a management side lawyer about this sort of legislation. I know employers feel like, oh great, one more thing I have to think about. But if you're thinking the right things, this is not a big deal. Yeah, and I would agree. I think if you think about the just creating inclusive work environments also, you know, being accepting of people um, regardless of any physical um, characteristic. I think that to your point, you focus on the job and, and what's required to work there. Before we move forward to the Daily Brew, Lori, there are a couple of questions. questions. Yeah. Yeah. So um, someone had asked about, um, uh, do we have a policy for pregnant, a sample policy for pregnancy accommodations? Um, that I, I, I assume this is regarding the new requirements. Um, and then there's another question around, um, are employers allowed to request medical certification and or healthcare provider recommendation under the Pregnancy Work, uh, Workplace Fairness Act using okay. FMLA or similar certificate certified documents? So two things. Um, do we have a sample policy? I mean, I don't, I am not a big fan of, here's my template, have at it, because I really think that there's an opportunity for error when we do it that way. Uh, can I give some bullet points to somebody who needs them? Absolutely. Uh, if you want me to look at your policy and tweak it some, absolutely. Um, I'm just not a one size fits all type person. I don't think that's a good practice. Um, but that said, I'm happy to help anybody give them some pointers as to the types of things you should include and talk about how that's going to work in your particular workplace. Um, so to feel free to reach out to me uh, if you'd like. Um, as for, it's, I'm, I'm very happy about this other question about medical certification mm -hmm. or healthcare provider. I, I don't, I have not seen yet, but I do not believe that the Pregnant Worker Fairness Act in some way 
supersedes or supplants the FMLA um, because it's really about accommodation and that sort of thing. If somebody needs uh, a leave of absence and that leave of absence qualifies as a serious health condition or for the birth or placement of a child, then FMLA protections will still apply and you will be able to use your FMLA paperwork for that purpose. I, again, I don't think the regs have been issued yet on the PWFA, but I cannot imagine that the PWFA isn't going to allow for documentation and an interactive process and requesting for information from a medical provider. The ADA allows that, the FMLA allows that, and I would expect the same. Um, Great. So um, well, do one thing I did want to point out, because we had a follow-up question on the, on the policy, the PWFA only applies to employers of 15 or more. So it would apply to same as like Title VII uh, and the, I think the ADA is 20 or more. I was, I was getting one's 15 and one's 20. But um, so if you're smaller than that, you don't have to worry about it from a compliance standpoint. Um, but if you are that size or larger, then, then yeah, you do. Okay. Great, great. And thank you everybody for your questions. Keep them coming as we move into our daily brew. You know, okay, COVID's over. End of COVID. What does that mean? <laughs> and and uh, artificial intelligence. So let's uh, let's let's hear from a legal perspective first. Okay. So what is the end of COVID? I think it ended on May 11th. Is that the date? I was looking yeah, it up. Yeah. So. May 11th, COVID was over. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Gone three years and two months to the day from when it started. Um, so COVID's not really over. I mean, it's still a thing, but the public health emergency, the public health declaration um, ended on May 11th. And that has an impact on various things like um, testing requirements, vaccines, um, other justifications for different policies that we have implemented in the workplace over the past three years during the pandemic. Um, I am not a benefits lawyer. So the stuff in these bullet points is straight from the Department of Labor website. I know um, the other side of the exude business has benefits folks. Yes. Call them or your benefits provider. But I did want to point them out because I think it's important that as, as a result of the, the end of the public health uh, emergency, benefit plans are no longer gonna be required to cover some services related to COVID, such as diagnostic testing, including over the counter test at no cost to the participant that can choose to do so. So that's a change. Um, coverage for COVID-19 vaccines will also change um, still be no cost if you're in network, but not, but are not required to be no cost if you're out of network. So if we think about this from a policy standpoint, we wanted to make testing and vaccines like available for everybody mm -hmm. without any sort of barriers, including financial. And so a lot of regulations, emergency orders, legislation was put into effect to um, make that easier, make it everything more accessible. Similarly, there were extensions of certain timeframes relating to enrollment or COBRA election or when the payment of COBRA premiums were due, submitting claims and appeals. All of those had been um, put into place uh, for employee benefits so that, again, we, weren't, we were removing barriers for access to people. Um, those are expected to end on July 10th, um, which is 60 days after the end of the emergency. Um, again, not a benefits lawyer, but according to the Department of Labor, if you many employees and dependents who are currently enrolled in Medicaid or CHIP coverage could lose that eligibility if that eligibility was granted because of the public health emergency. And um, so they may need other coverage. So you should, again, partner with your benefits folks uh, to get the information. A lot of the requirements associated with benefits as is usual, are notice requirements. So you need to let your employees know, this is what's changing under our plans. These are what your options are, et cetera, et cetera. Allison, I don't know if you have anything you wanna add there. No, the only thing I'm gonna add there is there's quite a bit in the news right now about this dropping from Medicaid um, for children. Not, I, I haven't seen it so much in this area, but I have seen it in Florida, You know, some of the, some of the other states. So uh, if you are, you know, if you, it, it's just something to be aware of as this continues to roll and we get closer to, to, um, to this date. Yep. Um, 
testing programs and vaccine mandates. So the questions are coming up. Well, do can I do I still do uh, COVID testing at work? Um, do I still have a vaccine mandate? So originally the justification, so it's the Americans with Disabilities Act that sort of was the federal law that was implicated by the various COVID requirements and what employers were trying to do. The public health emergency gave the justification under the direct threat provision of the ADA for employers to require testing to require vaccine mandates. Now that that has been removed, it doesn't mean that you can't do it, but the justification now is really far more industry focused rather than sort of this blanket justification we're in a public health emergency. So Mm -hmm. if you are still in a medical provider, if you are still in the healthcare industry, possibly other public facing type positions, then you know, testing might be justified as job related and consistent with business necessity. If you're quote, a regular old office space and people are sort of coming and going and you don't have any sort of underlying justification to use, to use a word to define a word, then, then it might not be something that you should continue. Similarly, vaccine requirements, um, many, many companies have shifted from mandate to we strongly encourage um, vaccination at this point. And I actually, I don't have a single client who kept track of vaccine boosters after the second booster. So I think company, I mean, I don't know whether it was fatigue or whether, you know, the, the justification seemed less prevalent when the, the death rates and infection rates mm-hmm. went down. I think, you know, s- some of that also sort of obviated. Mm-hmm. I would I would just add here, I think uh, just a couple of points from the HR side in, in clearly you want to review any employee communications you have around benefits just to s- see if they uh, need to be adjusted at all to reflect kind of the this new norm that we're experiencing. And then Lori mentioned, you know, your benefit plans please talk to your broker, whether it's Exude or whomever you're working with, with regards to your benefit plans to ensure that you, they are updated. um, Or if you're going through open enrollment um, or your renewals, just make sure that you have clear messaging for your, your staff on what this means. A couple of other um, quick things. And I know that, Allison, we're going to talk about this a lot. What does the end of COVID mean in terms of remote work, leaves of absence, and other accommodations? Mm -hmm. Um, You all remember the the coronavirus, I'm never going to remember the name, uh, something, the CC, it was an amendment to the FMLA that was in place for like 10 months that required that leave be granted for folks who were exposed to COVID or had COVID or recovering from COVID. Mm -hmm. That's been long extinguished, but the fact that the public health emergency is over does not mean that the regular protections that would go along with somebody with a serious illness have ended. So if you have an employee who has COVID that requires um, hospitalization or absence of more than three days or ongoing um, treatment, they still would be a qualified person under the FMLA, assuming that you as an employer qualify as the FMLA and that they meet the, the 1250 one year requirements. Mm-hmm. And so you still would be required to provide FMLA leave. Folks that have long haul COVID could be disabled under the ADA. Um, if somebody has a disability and that disability, um, is maybe autoimmune and you are in an industry where there's a higher susceptibility, this is sort of a gray area. Are you required to still allow them to work remotely? Um, Maybe. Again, you're gonna revert to that ADA reasonable accommodation analysis. Um, Some of this hasn't fleshed out. So even though quote COVID has ended, a lot of these protections that were there before still remain. Um, And lastly, form I-9, There was compliance flexibility during the pandemic because we couldn't see people in real life. And although the law technically requires that who's ever doing your I-9s actually hold the document and check it out and make sure that it's, you know, looks like the person that's in the ID document and, you know, meets all, it doesn't look like it's fraudulent. 
there was flexibility during the pandemic. Well, that ends um, as of July 31st, and you have one month thereafter to go back and physically inspect I-9 documents. So if you've hired people in the interim, there is a period of time to go back and confirm your I-9 verification that you did remotely during the pandemic, but it needs to be done and going forward, we're gonna go and do it the old fashioned way where somebody has to look at the documents and fill out the form in person. So. And so that's that's an interesting opportunity for HR because during this time, many organizations went 100% remote, right? So Lori, are you seeing any um, ways that employers are accommodating that need short of arranging a time to meet somebody in person to review those documents? I, you know, it's funny. I think um, a lot of employers don't know about this. And so I'm not sure. I think some of them might get tripped up. I would say that it gives you an opportunity to do a full I-9 audit. And so you should look at all your I-9 forms, then identify the ones that might need re-verification. Because if you have folks that are on, for example, non-immigrant visas or something else, they need their uh, I-9 forms re-verified anyway. And then any of the ones that have that were completed during the pandemic that were not completed in person, you should schedule like windows of time where the employee can come in, the sooner you identify, the longer you have to get it done. So if you wait till August 15th and go, oh, shoot, I have 122 people I have to <laughs> deal with, that's gonna be kind of a mess. So if you can do it sooner than that, then you can come up with the strategy, whether it's, you know, if you're gonna have a meeting that everybody's gonna come in town for anyway, you can do it at that point. You could have, um, you know, Friday funds with I-9 or so I'm making something up, but you know, where, <laughs> you know, on Fridays between 10 and 12, we're going to have this window available. The employee needs to schedule some time to come in and do this. So there are a lot of different ways of scheduling it that might be less of a burden on both the employee and the employer. Yeah. And, and so I know that some employers during uh, this period, during the co period of COVID were using, um, like notaries and things, so like a third party to review the documents. Any concerns with that? I know that, uh, that there's some, like some banks that have notaries were being asked to do the review for other companies. Any concerns about that in terms of <clears throat> compliance? I mean, you, so a couple things. Well, first of all, let me go back for a minute and say, if you're, if you use uh, E-Verify, this, it kind of fixes a lot of this for you. So that's um, one thing. Um, you can use, I think there are certain companies, and I, I hate to give people plugs, but I, I think that there are certain companies like Equifax that have remote I-9 verification programs. Like this was a as is want in the US, a, a capitalism opportunity. Like, let's come up with a way to solve this problem. Um, so um, you could use one of those. Your question is about concern. I would just wanna make sure that if you're gonna use an outside vendor, you would wanna have an agreement that provides some sort of uh, indemnification mm -hmm. if they'll agree to it, so that if you know there are fines and things, they'll cover them. Um, if you're gonna use somebody who's an agent on behalf of other than somebody like that. You wanna, again, make sure that it's somebody that you you know, feel is reliable, that you have obtained through some objective. It, your obligations are to, are to take reasonable measures. There's a balance in, in IRCA, right? Mm -hmm. The Immigration Reform and Control Act. And that is to do enough to make sure that you can in good faith defend that you're not employing unlawful undocumented workers um, balanced against you're not doing so much that you're discriminating against people on the basis of their national origin or race. So, you know, you don't want to pick some random person and, you know, somebody who then later could be suspect to do your I-9 mm -hmm. verification. Turns out it's somebody's cousin and they're lying. And, you know, if you couldn't figure that out, um, and it seems obvious to everybody else, you're going to be in trouble. But if you use a reputable source, uh, and in particular, if you can get kind of some kind of warranty or verification in your contract with them, then I think you can go ahead and do that. 
Great. Thank you for that. And I, and I would just say to everyone too, as you, if you turn on the news at any given time, there's a lot of talk about immigration right now. So I think Lori's point about using this opportunity to maybe do an audit, um, if, if you feel as though that's warranted in your organization, this may be a good time to do that, just to be proactive. So let's talk a little bit uh, more about um, what this means to return to work. It was interesting, LinkedIn had a survey that said prior to COVID, actually it wasn't prior to COVID, it was probably, no, just prior to COVID, one in 67 people worked some form of hybrid work and, and today it's one in six. So they're really, and if you if you look at any of the the the, the um, large consulting firms or those giving insight about the future of work, the future is really hybrid for those types of businesses that can support that. Obviously, healthcare, you know, the, the administrative is a different story, but those that are servicing people, you know, they'll continue to be on on site. But uh, the the key that that we're hearing is that the employee experience is your secret weapon to really being remaining relevant in the workplace and being able to attract and retain talent you know however you choose to structure your uh your your workplace flexibility is key and i believe we spoke about this on a previous morning blend or it may have been a podcast uh that you you can have flexibility in terms of the days of the week that they work, but also flexibility within the day is important. What the worker has, the today's employee has learned over this last few years from experience is that their time is not refundable. So they want the employer to use it with intention. So what does that mean? If you're going to ask people to come back to work and you're going to mandate those days, then make sure those days are meaningful. You know, if you bring somebody back and you're doing the same calls on Teams or Zoom or whatever venue you use, and I'm sitting at my desk now in an office and not having a face-to-face -face meeting with Lori, who's a couple of doors down or a couple of cubes down from me, that's not really using my time wisely. So I think employers that are being intentional about what in office time means and how to create those connections are are having better success at getting employees back into the office for for some of the time. Um, the the office needs to be energizing and not enervating. So that's kind of an interesting uh, uh, epiphany that people had. There's not everybody has toxic cultures, but you know there's some things that happen in a workplace that that can really be off-putting to employees. So, to if you want employees to come back into the workplace, if you haven't already addressed those issues, it's time to address those issues so that you can make the workplace inviting. Um, also, being able to share meaningful experiences with teammates—that's something that many of the much of the survey data has shown that if you're gonna invite me back into the, into the workplace, it doesn't have to mean the entire day is spent engaging with teammates, but I've seen some of our employers have what we call power days where they'll say, okay, on this these days of the month, we want everybody to come in. And they're very intentional about creating experiences for people to interact with people they may normally interact with in, in the course of the day online, but then also interact with people in the organization that they wouldn't typically interact with just to help people create that <clears throat> sense of um, engagement. It's interesting, over the weekend, I uh, attended a, um, an event with some people I hadn't, like a personal event that I hadn't seen in a really long time. And there was that next generation there, right? So all of our kids who are in their twenties and they're in the workplace. And I was asking them, what's it like to be back in work. And, and these were all, I'd say, young people somewhere between 23, 24, and 30. And they were talking about the positive experiences of being back in the office, which was nice to hear. And I asked them specifically, what is it that your employer is doing? Um, many of them in different ways shared that leadership makes it a point to stop by and have conversations with them not one hour conversations, but short conversations. And it makes them feel connected to the organization. One young man said to me, he said, no, you know, honestly, I can work from home. 
three days a week, but I actually choose to go in the office five days a week because I find it really interesting and I'm meeting really interesting people. So I think for your, your you know, the message here is your leaders need to be, um, and, and many of them may be already, but they have to be engaged uh, at all times. So when people are in the office, they really need to make the most of that time, whether it's checking in on someone, learning something about them personally, that, that you know, something about their sports team or whatever it happens to be, but make a connection. Um, we're also hearing that, you know, organizations in this next phase of where we are really should be investing in digital. Your tools matter. Access to information matters. Um, professional professional development for your leaders, and then the personal connection. The personal connection to people matters more than ever. Uh, there's also data out there that suggests if you are in the space of trying to pull people back in, use that uh, theory around it takes 30 days to change habits, right? We have to change some mental habits. The mental habit of, oh my gosh, it's so much easier for me to get up and sit at my kitchen table and not have to think about what I'm going to wear to work and think about the commute and think about all that time. You want them to actually think about, wow, when I get to the office today, I'm going to have a chance to connect with so-and-so, or I'm going to talk with my leader, or I'll have a chance to do these things. So if you are intentional about that as an employer, about those experiences, that over that 30, 60 day period, you change the mental habits of what it feels like to be back at work. Are you going to get people back at work five days a week? Personally, if unless you're in a totally client facing environment, I don't know about you, Lori, but I find that hard to say that in nope. my lifetime, we're going to go back to what it used to be. Well, you know, my, my older daughter is, a, is in a talent acquisition and it is a tremendous source of frustration um, when a hiring manager has, you know, sort of the pre pandemic expectations and the workforce, you know, might have incredible talent or skill um, and the job can be performed remotely and the candidate is like a top-notch candidate, but because you have a friction between, I want them in the office all the time and a lack of understanding as to why that would be important. And you have the talent over here that's that's like the right person for the job otherwise, especially when those two individuals are not even in the same office. I think that that the, we're not putting that genie back in the bottle. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think this quote from Forbes is interesting. The employee value proposition has shifted significantly from work for me to work with me. So I think if that's the, the message we can leave you with for this piece here is help think, help your organizations think about how you can um, change that, that feeling about, you know, working for me to working with me. So I know we're, we're coming up. We have about 15 minutes left, Lori, but you want to talk a little bit about um, our next topic? I do. I did want to mention because there's a bunch of questions in the chat. So let me just do this real quick oh, on I nine. Okay. I just want to make it clear: you can authorize, you can designate an authorized representative to view the the uh, employees I nine documents, but they also have to complete the section two portion of the form. So there's questions about: can we use a notary? Can we? you know, how do we do this with people working in various states, you can designate a third party, but they have to do the whole thing. You can't fill in part and then have them just do the document check. And if, if the documents were ever physically inspected, then you have satisfied the I-9 requirements. The, the flexibility was about allowing people to use non-in-person verification. So I hope that answered the questions that are out there. All right. <clears throat> so AI, which might be a thing that might be checking I-9s in the future. It's crazy. I know, I know. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, yeah, so I, you know, this stuff is, is brilliantly crazy. And um, I remember, I, I think, Allison, you know, in, I got my MBA in 2019. And in 2018, I was in the class at Temple. And the subject for that uh, weekend was um, IT. And 
the professor was talking about the rise of AI and how it's going to supplant people. And he's like, and even lawyers. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. And don't you know, I've just read an article about um, yeah. a firm that wanted to use AI to make, you know, arguments before the appellate court or, you know, in a jury trial and how successful or what the challenges might be associated with that. So it's here, it's coming. Um, for employers in particular, uh, from a legal perspective, you really need to be thoughtful about your use of AI when, it, when we're talking about hiring or in other employment decisions. Back in 2022, like it was so long ago, both the EEOC and the Department of Justice, Justice published guidance uh, relating to potential uh, ADA violations in using AI to <clears throat> um, make a employment selection processes and things like that. In <clears throat> also in 2022, the EEOC filed its first lawsuit against an employer for allegedly discriminating um, based on the use of AI technology during the hiring process. In January of this year, they issued their draft strategic enforcement plan. And earlier, I'm not exactly sure when, but I, I was just reading it today because our, our one of my partners had sent it around. The EEOC published um, their uh, technical advisor and I'm, the, the title is Select Issues, Assessing Adverse Impact in Software, Algorithms and Artificial Intelligence Used yeah. in Employment Selection Procedures under Title VII. And <clears throat> it's really looking at whether or not the use of these things um, is causing what we call disparate impact, which is a theory of discrimination under Title VII. Um, and this, the technical assistance that has been provided talks about the same sorts of things we would think about in any sort of hiring process testing that we might use to make sure that there aren't um, unconscious biases that we're not disparately impacting selecting out people on the basis of protected classes, such as race, color, religion, sex, national origin, um, that your selection process is job related and consistent with business necessity. So it's the same legal concepts, but they're now being applied. Um, and we can talk more about it, but I wanna make sure we get into sort of the, the I don't wanna say the HR piece, but like the, the what's, how's it really feel for people? Um, yeah. Uh, the White House had um, issued uh, a task force and its own guidance in 20, I forget if it was early 2023 or in 2022. So they're looking at it. And you can see in New York, effective July 5th, they have, again, New York City is very activist. Philadelphia is similarly, usually right behind New York City and mm -hmm. putting in place this sort of ordinance. Uh, New York City in 2023 will implement the use of uh or regulating the use of AI in employment decisions. Illinois has had that since 2020, Maryland since 2020, Washington DC is working on it. Their Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act failed most recently, but I'm sure it'll be reintroduced. Same thing in Massachusetts. Um, and Texas has introduced a bill that would establish the Artificial Intelligence Advisory Council to monitor Texas state agencies use of AI systems. Um, interestingly, in Texas, now I don't know if you remember, but during the pandemic, uh, uh, unemployment claims were a cluster, right? And Texas, the Texas Workforce Commission uh, was allegedly able to clear its backlog of unemployment claims using a chat bot. So, Fascinating. Um, yeah. So anyway, I, I, all of these, the, the kind of gist of all of these are that there has to be notice, that people have to know that you're using these tools, that um, they can get some sort of accommodation if there's some issue with the use of those tools. Um, again, you know, looking at the impact of the use of those tools, are your if you compare prior pre-use to use, are you now only getting, you know, the same kind of applicant? And have we now screamed out? so that we're not getting women or people of color through that preliminary screening right. phase. Here's what's, uh, and one last anecdote, and then, and then we can have a, a discussion about it. A friend of mine uh, that I saw yesterday has a niece who just ran her resume through AI to like clean it up or whatever, and um, don't know yet, but we're fascinated to see whether she gets more hits in her job search 
because AI might speak AI better than, than we do. So. Yeah, it, it's, it's so fascinating. And the, your point about what happens, you know, that Philadelphia is not far behind New York City. I think once you start seeing these, um, these, these laws go into effect and the impact on employers, you know, there are penalties. It's $500 to $1,500 per, per uh, day per violation. Yeah. And there are requirements around having to do an audit and post that bias audit on your website. So, so this is, this is happening fast and furiously. So let's talk a little bit more about it and where it is today, what you can think about the impact of the work environment and as an employer, what you could be thinking about. Um, I think it's interesting that, you know, a good percent of the, of the, of human resources functions across the world, companies are using some sort of AI augmentation, right? They're using something usually with regards to talent acquisition. That's where we started seeing the people analytics. However, we're also seeing it, you know, in health and safety, we're seeing it in, in, uh, uh, originally seeing it in, in like the banking industry where they were looking at it from a risk management perspective. Um, there are some benefits to AI, certainly, but there are some real concerns. That concern around bias is, is very real. And um, that whole field of AI and in, 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 in data science, as we've probably all heard, um, tends to draw from similar demographics the it, who the people behind the scenes who are actually programming this information and statistically 88% of all ai workers are men and it's also 80% of all professors in that space so nothing against the men who are on the call here but if you drill down to the information it's also in our country it's mostly white men so when you think about potential unconscious bias and, and, and creating these, these algorithms that are based on data, but then also based on um, historic information of an organization. So if historically it was set up a certain kind of way and then you're, the algorithm is, is growing off that historic data, then you may be perpetuating um, concerns and issues around hiring discrimination. So we have to be really, really mindful of that. And that's why you're seeing these laws pop up to be able to check the growth and the, and the speed at which AI is, is entering our workforce. Um, we also see it supporting businesses, you know, internally, externally with, um, with, Customer service, chat boxes. Lori just gave the explanation of Texas with unemployment and clearing that out. So that that's a huge benefit. However, it also creates a risk in the sense of exposing your information using chatbots um, into that universe that is out there that could create, you know, opportunities for hackers um, or or uh, what is the term they're using now? Ransom ransomware getting into your systems. I think where we, we've seen quite a bit of it, and even in the early stages before we were talking a lot about AI was in the risk management, you know, they've got for years, the banking industry has been able to detect patterns of speech and emails and things like that. They've used AI to, to, to detect potential fraudulent uh, activity in among employees within, within the industry. So uh, there's, you know, there are good uses for it, but certainly there are opportunities for us to be concerned. Um, you may have heard some of these stats. I just think it's important to think about it, that AI could displace roughly 15% of workers um, somewhere between 2016 and 2030. There is one scenario that showed it could be up to 30% displacement of workers. Laura, you talked about you know, law and right. we're seeing that the prediction was in financial services um, would, would, would be an industry that would take, uh, uh, that there was a lot of opportunity to employ AI, but then from even from like legal, just review of contracts. Once this technology gets smarter and smarter, um, how it could actually be used to potentially displace some early um, career. Yeah, in, roles. In, in this same conversation that I was alluding to, um, another person that that the, my friend was talking about is a young man who's now in. Um, I guess he's in his post-med, what do they call that? Residency um, for mm -hmm. radiology. And they were having a discussion about AI and the impact on, in particular, the science and the medical field and whether or not it would replace certain jobs. And 
his perspective, and I think this goes to your next point, was that it will be an a tool, but it's not going to eliminate the need for right. radiologists because what it'll do is if he has a hundred screens to read, it can now move the ones that are the most crucial to the top. So that if, you know, there's a, a problematic one that's at 99 that he's not going to get to, well, now they're going to be reordered by the AI. He still has to do the reading. So I think we're going to see you know, the, a lot of people are worried, oh, we're going to lose jobs. But I think this is the same conversation we had, you know, 100, 200 years ago during the Industrial Revolution, right? Yeah. Oh, my gosh, we're never going to, you know, what are these people going to do yeah. instead? I think the difference is this is moving at a faster pace than we ever would have imagined. Like this, this is, yeah. I think you may have heard that the head of IT for, uh, for was it Google, resigned because he was concerned about the pace and the ethics around the use of AI. This just happened in the last couple of weeks. And he didn't, he said, look, Google's been really good about uh, how they've thought about this, but I wanted to remove myself so I can speak out and educate organizations on this without impacting my employer because that he has real concerns. And this is one of the alleged pioneers of this technology. So will humans still have a role? Absolutely. I think where we have to be concerned or aware um, is the increase the increase in manufactured information. So this could raise levels of distrust, discontent and, and reputational risk for organizations. So again, uh, people will believe what they hear. We have to educate people to challenge and check facts or if they're gonna use this information, how they're gonna use this information and how they're going to use this information to conduct the work that you're asking them to do. Uh, this whole chat GPT piece is, is important as well. Um, I, I was talking with Lori prior to this session, and a number of organizations, mostly banks and technology companies, have put out policies to uh, prohibit the use of uh, chat GP, GPT in, in use of, in the conducting of work. Um, so you think about that. That information, you start plugging in the facts about whatever it is you're looking for them to provide guidance on, that goes into our little cyber world. And those could be uh, company secrets, if you will, or company protected information, confidential information. So it's really time for employers to update policies. The message here is not to prohibit the use of chat GPT, but to educate and to really think about how that fits into the work that you do. Remember, this is all new and it's an exciting tool. And as soon as it came out, people are going on and checking it out. And they may be doing that um, on company time. So you have to look at your policies and, and your standards around the use, just as you did when Facebook and all social media um, venues became public and, and in part of mainstream. Uh, communicate updates, reset expectations, but really educate people on what's in, what's important. Uh, the other thing to think about is consider upskilling employees. Now, there are a lot of organizations that have IT functions that are, that are supporting um, the IT function in getting these nano degrees, these short, very focused, low cost training, online training in specific areas. It's, it's really helping people get uh, up to speed or ahead of this curve in a very um, efficient and, and cost-effective way. There, I listed here some names of organizations that are offering these. I'd also encourage you to think about skills in general across the board for your employees. What is it we can do to upskill people in anticipation of uh, some of the, the efficiencies that AI would be creating. Some of the larger organizations have partnered with these companies to offer these nano degrees internally. Um, as always, I feel like we always say this, but I, I think <laughs> training your managers um, on how to effectively work in this new ever-changing environment. We've talked today really about how the employee experience matters. It's always mattered, but it matters more than ever. Um, educating them, reminding them about um, bias and hiring, uh, the legalities around hiring and firing and their interactions and making sure that they are uh, up to speed and in and, and, and operating in alignment with your policies and your, and your culture. Uh, cybersecurity, I know we just went through it. We go through it every year. You know, 
is it every year? Is it more frequently than that now? And do you need to refresh or do these little um, pulse cybersecurity add-ons to make sure people are effectively trained and aware to protect your organization, to protect your staff, and to perfect, protect the information uh, that they may be putting somewhere on the, on the web. We and with that, I think that brings us right up to the hour. So I want to thank everybody so much for joining us today. Uh, we hope that we gave you a few nuggets of information that will be helpful for you. Uh, again, a recording of this will be sent out. So please feel free to share that with someone that wasn't able to attend today. And I, on behalf of Exude Human Capital, and we want to thank Lori for your partnership and Fox Rothschild for your partnership. And thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you all. Hope to see you at our next uh, morning brew. Great. Thank you, everyone.